Matthew Henry's Commentary on the Whole Bible Leviticus 6 The first seven verses of this chapter might fitly have been added to the foregoing chapter, being a continuation of the law of the trespass offering, and the putting of other cases in which it was to be offered, and with this end the instructions God gave concerning the several kinds of sacrifices that should be offered, and then at verse 8, which in the original begins a new section of the law, he comes to appoint the several rites and ceremonies concerning these sacrifices which had not been mentioned before. 1. The burnt offering, verses 8 to 13. 2. The meat offering, verses 11 to 18, particularly that at the consecration of the priest, verses 19 to 23. 3. The sin offering, verse 24, etc. Law of the Trespass Offering, 1490 B.C. 1 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 2 If a soul sin, and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, 3 Or have found that which was lost, and leath concerning it, and sweareth falsely, in any of all these that a man doeth, sinning therein, for then it shall be, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost th thing which he found, five or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle, and shall have the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. 6 And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation, for a trespass offering, unto the priest, seven and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for any thing of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. This is the latter part of the law of the trespass offering, the former part, which concerned trespasses about holy things, we had in the close of the foregoing chapter, this concerns trespasses in common things. Observe here. I, the trespass supposed, verses 2 and 3. Though all the instances relate to our neighbor, yet it is called a trespass against the Lord, because, though the injury be done immediately to our neighbor, yet an affront is thereby given to his Maker and our Master. He that speaks evil of his brother is said to speak evil of the law, and consequently of the lawmaker, James 4 verse 11. Though the person injured be ever so mean and despicable, and every way our inferior, yet the injury reflects upon that God who has made the command of loving our neighbor second to that of loving himself. The trespasses specified are, 1. Denying a trust, if a man lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep or, which is worse, which was lent him for his use. If we claim that as our own which is only borrowed, left in our custody, or committed to our care, this is a trespass against the Lord, who, for the benefit of human society, will have property and truth maintained. 2. Defrauding a partner, if a man lie in fellowship, claiming a sole interest in that wherein he has but a joint interest. 3. Disowning a manifest wrong, if a man has the front to lie in a thing taken away by violence, which ordinarily cannot be hid. 4. Deceiving in commerce or, as some think, by false accusation, if a man have deceitfully oppressed his neighbor, as some read it, either withholding what is due or extorting what is not. 5. Detaining what is found, and denying it, verse 3, if a man have found that which was lost, he must not call it his own presently, but endeavor to find out the owner, to whom it must be returned, this is doing as we, as we would be done by, but he that lies concerning it, that falsely says he knows nothing of it, especially if he back this lie with a false oath, trespasseth against the Lord, who to everything that is said is a witness, but in an oath he is the party appealed to, and highly affronted. When he is called to witness to a lie, 2. The trespass offering appointed. 1. In the day of his trespass offering he must make satisfaction to his brother. This must be first done if thy brother hath ought against thee, because he hath sinned and is guilty, verses 4 and 5, that is, is convicted of his guilt by his own conscience, and is touched with remorse for it, seeing himself guilty before God, let him faithfully restore all that he has got by fraud or oppression, with a fifth part added, to make amends to the owner for the loss and trouble he had sustained in the meantime, let him account both for debt and damages. Note, where wrong has been done restitution must be made, until it is made to the utmost of our power, or an equivalent accepted by the person wronged, 
we cannot have the comfort of the forgiveness of the sin, for the keeping of what is unjustly God avows the taking and both together make but one continued act of unrighteousness. To repent is to undo what we have done amiss, which, whatever we pretend, we cannot be said to do till we restore what has been got by it, as Zacchaeus, Luke 19 verse 8, and make satisfaction for the wrong done. 2. He must then come and offer his gift, must bring his trespass offering to the Lord whom he had offended, and the priest must make an atonement for him, verses 6 and 7. This trespass offering could not, of itself, make satisfaction for sin, nor reconciliation between God and the sinner, but as it signified the atonement that was to be made by our Lord Jesus, when he should make his soul an offering or sin, a trespass offering, it is the same word that is here used, Isaiah 53 verse 10. The trespasses here mentioned are trespasses still against the law of Christ, which insists as much upon justice and truth as ever the law of nature or the law of Moses did, and though now we may have them pardoned without a trespass offering, yet not without true repentance, restitution, reformation, and a humble faith in the righteousness of Christ, and, if any make them more bold with these sins because they are not now put to the expense of a trespass offering for them, they turn the grace of God into wantonness, and so bring upon themselves a swift destruction. The Lord is the avenger of all such, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 6. Law of the Burnt Offering, 1490 B.C. 8 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 9 Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering, it is the burnt offering, because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. 10 And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. 11 And he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. 12 And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. 13 The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out. Hitherto we have had the instructions which Moses was directed to give to the to the people concerning the sacrifices, but here begin the instructions he was to give to the priests, he must command Aaron and his sons, verse 9. The priests were rulers in the house of God, but these rulers must be ruled, and those that had the command of others must themselves be commanded. Let ministers remember that not only commissions, but commands, were given to Aaron and his sons, who must be in subjection to them. In these verses we have the law of the burnt offering, as far as it was the peculiar care of the priests. The daily sacrifice of a lamb, which was offered morning and evening for the whole congregation, is here chiefly referred to. 1. The priest must take care of the ashes of the burnt offering, that they be decently disposed of, verses 10 and 11. He must clear the altar of them every morning, and put them on the east side of the altar, which was furthest from the sanctuary, this he must do in his linen garment, which he always wore when he did any service at the altar and then he must shift himself, and put on other garments, either such as were his common wear or, as some think, other priestly garments less honorable, and must carry the ashes into a clean place without the camp. Now, 1. God would have this done, for the honor of his altar and the sacrifices that were burnt upon it. Even the ashes of the sacrifices must be preserved, to testify the regard God had to it, by the burnt offering he was honored, and therefore thus it was honored. And some think that this care which was taken of the ashes of the sacrifice typified the burial of our Savior, his dead body, the ashes of his sacrifice, was carefully laid up in a garden, in a new sepulchre, which was a clean place. It was also requisite that the altar should be kept as clean as might be, the fire upon it would burn the better, and it is decent in a house to have a clean fireside. 2. God would have the priests themselves to keep it so, to teach them, and as to stoop to the meanest services for the honor of God and of his altar. The priest himself must not only kindle the fire, but clean the hearth and carry out the ashes. God's servants must think nothing below them but sin. 2. The priest must take care of the fire upon the altar, that it be kept always burning. This is much insisted on here, verses 9 and 12, and this express law is given, the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, it shall never go out, verse 13. We may suppose that no day passed without some extraordinary sacrifices, which were always offered between the morning and evening lamb, so that from morning to night the fire on the altar was kept up of course. 
but to preserve it all night unto the morning, verse 9, required some care. Those that keep good houses never let their kitchen fire go out, therefore God would thus give an instance of his good housekeeping. The first fire upon the altar came from heaven, chapter 9 verse 24, so that by keeping that up continually with a constant supply of fuel all their sacrifices throughout all their generations might be said to be consumed with that fire from heaven in token of God's acceptance. If, through carelessness, they should ever let it go out, they could not expect to have it so kindled again. Accor accordingly the Jews tell us that the fire never did go out upon the altar, till the captivity in Babylon. This is referred to Isaiah 31 verse 9, where God is said to have his fire in Zion, and his furnace in Jerusalem. By this law we are taught to keep up in our minds a constant disposition to all acts of piety and devotion, and habitual affection to divine things, so as to be always ready to every good word and work. We must not only not quench the Spirit, but we must stir up the gift that is in us. Though we be not always sacrificing, yet we must keep the fire of holy love always burning, and thus we must pray always. Law of the Meat Offering, 1490 B.C. 14 And this is the law of the meat offering, the sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar. 15 And he shall take of it his handful, of the flour of the meat offering, and of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering, and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savour, even the memorial of it, unto the Lord. 16 And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat, with unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation they shall eat it. 17 It shall not be bacon with leaven. I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings made by fire, it is most holy, as is the sin offering, and as the trespass offering. 18 All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord made by fire, every one that toucheth them shall be holy. 19 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 20 This is the offering of Aaron and of his sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed, the tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meat offering perpetual, half of it in the morning, and half thereof at night. 21 In a pan it shall be made with oil, and when it is bacon, thou shalt bring it in, and the bacon pieces of the meat offering shalt thou offer for a sweet, a sweet savour unto the Lord. 22 And the priest of his sons that is anointed in his stead shall offer it, it is a statute for ever unto the Lord, it shall be wholly burnt. 23 For every meat offering for the priest shall be wholly burnt, it shall not be eaten. The meat offering was either that which was offered by the people, or that by the priests at their consecration. Now. 1. As to the common meat offering. 1. Only a handful of it was to be burnt upon the altar all the rest was allowed to the priests for their food. The law of the burnt offerings was such as imposed upon the priests a great deal of care and work, but allowed them little profit, for the flesh was wholly burnt, and the priests had nothing but the skin. But to make them amends the greatest part of the meat offering was their own. The burning of a handful of it upon the altar, verse 15, was ordered before, chapter 2 verses 2 and 9. Here the remainder of it is consigned to the priests, the servants of God's house, I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings, verse 17. Note, 1. It is the will of God that his minister should be well provided for with food convenient, and what is given to them he accepts as offered to himself, if it be done with a single eye. 2. All Christians, being spiritual priests, do themselves share in the spiritual sacrifices they offer. It is not God that is the gainer by them, the handful burnt upon the altar was not worth speaking of, in comparison with the priest's share, we ourselves are the gainers by our religious services. Let God have all the frankincense, and the priests shall have the flour and the oil, what we give to God the praise and glory of we may take to ourselves the comfort and benefit of. 2. The laws concerning the eating of it were, 1. That it must be eaten unleavened, verse 16. What was offered to God must have no leaven in it, and the priests must have it as the altar had it, and no otherwise. Thus must we keep the feasts of the Lord with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 2. It must be eaten in the court of the tabernacle, here called the holy place, in some room prepared by the side of the court for this purpose. It was a great crime to carry any of it out of the court. 
The very eating of it was a sacred rite, by which they were to honor God, and therefore it must be done in a religious manner, and with a holy reverence, which was preserved by confining it to the holy place. 3. The males only must eat of it, but, verse 18. Of the less holy things, as the first fruits and tithes, and the shoulder and breasts of the peace offerings, the daughters of the priests might eat, for they might be carried out of the court, but this was of the most holy things, which being to be eaten only in the tabernacle, the sons of Aaron only might eat of it. 4. The priests only that were clean might eat of it, every one that toucheth them shall be holy, verse 18. Holy things for holy persons. Some read it, everything that toucheth it shall be holy, al the furniture of the table on which these holy things were eaten must be appropriated to the Jews only, and never after used as common things. 2. As to the consecration meat offering, which was offered for the priests themselves, it was to be wholly burnt, and none of it eaten, verse 23. It comes in here as an exception to the foregoing law. It should seem that this law concerning the meat offering of initiation did not only oblige the high priest to offer it, and on that day only that he was anointed, and so for his successors in the day they were anointed, but the Jewish writers say that by this law every priest, on the day he first entered upon his ministry, was bound to offer this meat offering, that the high priest was bound to offer it every day of his life, from the day in which he was anointed, and that it was to be offered. Besides the meat offering that attended the morning and evening sacrifice, because it is said here to be a meat offering perpetual, verse 20. Josephus says, the high priest sacrificed twice every day at his own charges, and this was his sacrifice. Note, those whom God has advanced above others in dignity and power ought to consider that he expects more from them than from others, and should attend to every intimation of service to be done for him. The meat offering of the priest was to be baked as if it were to be eaten, and yet it must be wholly burnt. Though the priest that ministered was to be paid for serving the people, yet there was no reason, reason that he should be paid for serving the high priest, who was the father of the family of the priests, and whom therefore any priest should take a pleasure in serving gratis. Nor was it fit that the priests should eat of the offerings of a priest, for as the sins of the people were typically transferred to the priests, which was signified by their eating of their offerings, Hosea 4 verse 8, so the sins of the priests must be typically transferred to the altar, which therefore must eat up all their offerings. We are all undone, both ministers and people, if we must bear our own iniquity, nor could we have had any comfort or hope if God had not laid on his dear son the iniquity of us all, and he is both the priest and the altar. Law of the Sin Offering, 1490 B.C. 24 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 25 Speak unto Aaron, and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering, in the place where the burnt offering is killed shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord, it is most holy. 26 The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it, in the holy place shall it be eaten, in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. 27 Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy, and when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof, thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. 28 But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden shall be broken, and if it be sodden in a brazen pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. 29 All the males among the priests shall eat thereof, it is most holy. 30 And no sin offering, whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place, shall be eaten, it shall be burnt in the fire. We have here so much of the law of the sin offering as did peculiarly concern the priests that offered it. As, 1. That it must be killed in the place where the burnt offering was killed, verse 25, that is, on the north side of the altar, chapter 1 verse 11, which, some think typified the crucifying of Christ on Mount Calvary, which was on the north side of Jerusalem. 2. That the priest who offered it for the sinner was, with his sons, or other priests, verse 29, to eat the flesh of it, after the blood and fat had been offered to God, in the court of the tabernacle, verse 26. Hereby they were to bear the iniquity of the congregation, as it is explained, chapter 10 verse 17. 3. The blood of the sin offering was with great reverence to be washed out of the clothes on which it happened to light, verse 27, which signified the awful regard we ought to have to the blood of Christ, not counting it a common thing, that blood must be sprinkled on the conscience, not on the raiment. 4. 
The vessel in which the flesh of the sin offering was boiled must be broken if it were an earthen one, and, if a brazen one, well washed, verse 28. This intimated that the defilement was not wholly taken away by the offering, but did rather cleave to it, such was the weakness and deficiency of those sacrifices, but the blood of Christ thoroughly cleanses from all sin, and after it there needs no cleansing. 5. That all this must be understood of the common sin offerings, not of those for the priest, or the body of the congregation, either occasional, or stated upon the day, day of atonement, for it had been before ordained, and was now ratified, that if the blood of the offering was brought into the holy place, as it was in those extraordinary cases, the flesh was not to be eaten, but burnt without the camp, verse 30. Hence the apostle infers the advantage we have under the gospel above what they had under the law, for though the blood of Christ was brought into the tabernacle, to reconcile within the holy place, yet we have a right by faith to eat of the altar, Hebrews 13 verses 10-12, and so to take the comfort of the great propitiation.